Thank you, Renelis. Thank you all uh, for coming. So today I'm going to present uh, work that we, as a big group, have done on the influence of the Mississippi River Plume on surface only in the northern Gulf of Mexico. So as you can imagine, this was inspired by the Deepwater Horizon oil spill in, back in 2010. So you know, on April 20 that year, the Deepwater Horizon platform exploded, killing 11 people. And for, uh, later on, until July 15, that was to place the largest oil spill in US history. And at that time, there were concerns of distant export of oil throughout the whole eastern Gulf of Mexico due to the basin dynamics. And this is a quite famous picture. This is sea surface temperature with the warm loop current in the eastern Gulf of Mexico. And we see oil and train uh, from around the platform here towards the loop current and, and like in, in, uh, in one of the, of the frontal cyclonic eddies. So this is known as the tiger tail episode during mid-May of 2010. And that, that raised big concern at the time. But we know that eventually the rest of the Gulf and the, the oil was contained in the northern Gulf of Mexico. And southerly winds played a, a very important role in that because they dominated, dominated the period and pushed the oil towards the shores, the northern shores uh, of, the, of the Gulf. So this is a map with the, um, cumulated, uh, the yeah, cumulated presence of oil during the Deepwater Horizon oil spill. And we see that it's really contained in the northern Gulf with oil making landfall mostly uh, around the Mississippi Delta and uh, in Louisiana and in the Mississippi and Alabama. But less, is, less known is the role that the Mississippi River Plume played during the oil spill. So this is uh, results from um, uh, modeling studies. So this is sea surface salinity from a high resolution model. And on the right is observation, the presence of oil from observations. And uh, this is uh, June 15. And we see on that date that the Mississippi River Plume is extending uh, northeastward and is uh, blocking the, the, the oil from reaching the coastline, the Louisiana coastline, at least at that time. Um, and on the other hand, in early July, we see that the, the river plume is more closer to the delta and stronger westward current along the southern Louisiana shelf, uh, and the oil is following that pathway. And so the, the, the shape of the plume, the, the dynamics of the river plume ha, hasn't had an impact on the, on the presence of oil at the surface during the spill. And this inspired, this raised a couple of questions, um, such as how would the pathways of the oil released during the Deepwater Horizon might differ if the conditions were different, if the loop current was different, if the winds were different, if the river discharge was different. And more generally, what's the role of the river plume uh, on the, and the related fronts in the northern Gulf of Mexico on the shoreward or, or offshore export of oil uh, in this area where there is a lot of oil exploration. And so this led to a research project that was uh, funded by the Gulf of Mexico Research Initiative, which followed the, the Deepwater Horizon oil spill. And the, the project is called Influence of River Induced Fronts on Hydrocarbon Transport. It's led by Vili Kroafalu. Um, at Rasmus across the street. And the model combines the use of modeling with hydrodynamics here in Miami and uh, oil spill modeling with our colleagues from Norway and also observations that will be focused on the Taylor Energy site. And we have yeah, two partners, Oscar Garcia and Tran Min from USF. So what's Taylor Energy Platform? It's a less known oil spill in the Gulf. So the Taylor Energy Platform was an oil platform that sunk in, back in 2004 after Hurricane Ivan. And there has been small but continuous oil leak at the surface since then. And so this is the Mississippi Delta. And this is superimposed in various colors, the presence of oil at the surface. And so we can really see that it's much closer to the Delta than the Deepwater Horizon platform was. So this is the Delta, so really, really close. And we see that the oil is extending in um, various direction to the northeast, southwest, and uh, also offshore. And so this, because it's so close, it's really under direct influence of the, of the river room dynamics. So it's a very good study case for studying the interactions between the river plume and the oil transport. And so as part of our project, we uh, undertook field work at that site. And this was also a co collaboration with another group Another group fund, funded by uh, Gomery, it's um, the 
Consortium for Advanced Research on Transport of Hydrocarbon in the Environment, uh, the, you know, the short name CARTH. It's a big project. It's a big consortium funded by, um, led by Tamayos Gokman from Rasmus across the street. And this work is a multi-platform approach with in-situ uh, data with deployment of different types of surface and surface drifters. I'll go into more details but also the use of drones and of shipborne ob observations because the CART group uh, worked with us on April 20, one of the three days that we deployed uh, measurements. And they came with the Walton Smith and took CTD cast and also uh, vertical profiles of temperature and salinity. And as well, they had an X-band radar on board so they were able to map surface currents and also that's useful for the detection of oil. And in addition to those in-situ data, we used uh, satellite imagery, SAR high resolution, that allows us to detect the presence of oil. And also, we also use ocean color and more classical antimetry and SST data. So now I'm going to focus a little bit more on the various types of drifters that we used. We were able to collect different um, surface and surface drifters, two types of mid-ocean uh, drifters. First, the ice sphere, which is this one. It's, um, it's uh, about the size of a basketball, and it's um, for the studying the very surface currents, and it's supposed to mimic the, the behavior of the oil at the surface. And in addition to this surface, they have another design with the also famous code drifter, which is more near surface. It's in the first top meter of the water, and the center of mass is about 70 centimeters below the surface. In addition to those classical designs, we use the Karth um, design drifters. So this is uh, uh, the shape of that drifter. There's a float at the surface and a drug underneath. And those drifters are biodegradable. And so when the drug is on, it's um, the center of mass is uh, 40 centimeters below the surface. So it's really mimicking the top meter of the waters, or half meter, if that's it. And, but if you remove the drug, then the float is really uh, surface driven. So those are the, the the type of drifters and so yeah this this is me deploying one of them and you can see about the size of, of these these drifters there about that size so the first uh, day at uh, on site was on april 18 so this is a map of ocean color on that day so we see that the teller site is here near the edge of the uh, river plume and it's really inside the mississippi river plume and that has uh, important consequences so uh, the drifter, the, uh, that day we only deployed surface drifters, so I'm going to present that. Uh, this is uh, e, uh, RGB images which are well uh, adapted for studying the river waters. And so we see that on the first day, the day that we deployed the drifters, they were initially a little, uh, a little distance north, north uh, westward, and then they were advected eastward following the edge of the, of the main river from here. And they continued doing that the next day. And we really see that their trajectories um, match the extent of the river plume. So they're really surfing on the edge of the, of the plume. And so the surface undrug drifters uh, went along that pathway very fast. And the drug near surface drifters followed uh, on the same path, but a little more, more slowly. Uh, this is a summary on the top left, the summary of the drifter trajectories. So we use, yeah, the color scale is for undrogged or drogged, which means uh, surface or near surface. We see what I just presented, how they all went together along the river plume. And then the surface ones made landfall and the near surface ones stayed much longer in the water and they started extending offshore here. So we see here how they followed the river plume early. And then we see uh, between April 20 and May 6, how the river plume extended offshore because the, the initial trajectory was really at the edge, and we see how the river plume extended offshore. And that's because of uh, reversal of the winds uh, during between uh, the, the, re the deployment and uh, affecting the, the trajectory. So we see in few instances in uh, late April and early May, the winds reversed, and this is associated with offshore shoots of the drift of trajectories. Now, moving on to day two, which was on April 20. So this is again a an, an, an chlorophyll image on that day, but the main difference is that that day the Taylor site was slightly outside the riverfront. And so we were based in the Southern Pass here. So on our way to the, 
to the to the experiment site that day we were able to see very well defined front at the surface first uh, front between the brown brackish waters directly coming out of the pass and more green uh, waters that were already standing there and further on uh, really close to the teller site there was another very neat front which we see here with these green waters really next to blue crystal clear waters and the front was really marked with a lot of seaweeds and um, sargassum and oil. So that's the day that the Walton Smith uh, joined us for um, um, yeah, bringing additional uh, resources for measurements. So this is the through flow sea surface salinity from the Walton Smith and we see so this this is the track that they did. They are about six, seven kilometers long. So it's very, it's quite short. It's really at the edge. And we really see the, the drop in salinity from 37 down to 28 in the matter of yeah, six or seven kilometers. So the, the, the gradient is ex extremely strong. And now if we go below the surface with the toad measurements, uh, we see this signature in salinity here. And we see that the, the edge <coughs> of the Mississippi River plume was five to 10 meters deep. And we see in temperature that outside the river plume, the mixed layer is about 40 meters deep. And going to, on the river side, we see increased temperature in the river dominated surface waters. And the, below that, we see temperature inversion. So the vertical structure in just a few uh, hundred meters uh, apart is really, really different. In addition to the, those vertical measurements, we had access to X-band radar on board of the Walton Smith. So this is synthetic at three different times of that day. So the background is the, the backscatter, I think, from the radar. So we see the different types with the different shades of, uh, that are associated with the different types of water, as well as with the presence of oil. And we use a newly uh, uh, design technique to retrieve surface currents based on these radar measurements. So those are the red uh, uh, arrows. And we really see a very sharp change in the surface currents between the southern part of the front, the, the Gulf waters, and the river plume, with a change in direction and a change in velocity, which is very, very marked. And this front correspond, we were able to find a match in the um, satellite-derived chlorophyll A. And um, so we really, we really, the, so the, the front that between the Mississippi River Plume and the outer waters is really marked not only in salinity, but in, in surface currents as well. And what we really, we see here also is, so this is the front and we see with the, in black, we see the spreading of the oil. So this is at 16, 20, 16, yeah, between uh, um, uh, 16 and 17 UTC about the time that we were on the site. And we see here the, the very close to the front, southern south of the front, the, the location of the oil leak. And a few hours later at 1830, which is like two hours later, the front has moved more than one kilometer away. So that front moves really, really fast. So it's it gets very tricky to observe and that has major impact on, on the transport pathways, of, obviously. Now, going to satellite imagery, we see with the, this radar sat image, what, what we saw also on the radar. So that was a few hours earlier. We see the northward extension of the, the oil at the surface, encountering the river front and then being advected westward. And that's what we see also on the drone. So uh, on that picture on the, on the right, you see the tiny boat that we were on during that day. And you also clearly see the, the ocean uh, the, the oil at the surface of, of, the, of the ocean going northward towards the, the river plume, and we see the front really, really marked. And when we were on site, we were able to tell that the oil was blocked at the front and uh, advected westward with, with the river plume waters. And yeah, no oil was observed across the front when we were on site. Now, going to the drifters that were deployed that day, we, that time we can really see two groups of drifters. So the surface ones were advected westward. They are in, in dark blue, dark green, and black on the top left panel. And they follow the same pathway as the, the drifters deployed two days earlier. But the near surface ones, they lingered around for a few days, and then they were advected offshore a few days later. So on the chlorophyll images, you can see so in more details that the 
the surface drifters really followed the edge of the main river front, whereas the, the drogged ones were adducted uh, offshore. And this is, um, I'm going to focus on this offshore export now. So those are, again, chlorophyllae with, at different dates after the, the deployment. So we see on April 27th the first signature of this uh, offshore uh, export, and that's, yeah, it's associated with the presence of a filament of um, high, higher chlorophyll um, detaching, expanding from the main river plume. So this is clear on April 27th and May 1st, not as much on May 6th. That's really the end of this event as we can see it with the, the ocean color imagery. And this um, is associated with the change of wind direction around April 23rd, which I, I, I mentioned earlier. And that leads to the blockage of the natural westward propagation of the river waters and the reversal of the main plume uh, dynamics towards the east and northeast. And that favors also the, the formation of filaments that go offshore. So this is yeah, the, the wind reversal of April 25th after a few days of um, easterlies blowing and favoring the, the downstream westward uh, natural displacement of the old of the Mississippi River Plume. In addition to the winds, this offshore entrainment are favored by the regional mesoscale dynamics. So those are um, observations from the satellite altimetry on the left and in addition with SST on the right. So this is early April, mid April and early May. So we see that um, the loop current was retracted at that time, but there's a, a quite large loop current anticyclonic eddy in the region that is extending off, uh, northward, sorry, during um, during April, with the presence of a small cyclonic eddy uh, really near its its edge. So that's those are the two features that will play a role because we see on early May that between the the loop current eddy, which is anticyclonic, and the cyclonic eddy, there is a path that favors the offshore export of surface waters. So. This is clearly seen in sea surface temperature on early May. There's a filament of colder waters associated with the northern Gulf waters that is advected in between those two uh, eddies. And that's what we saw on the ocean color, and that's the path that the drifters followed as seen on, on this map. So this, in addition to the winds, uh, allows the export of, of some river waters and whatever goes with it. So finally, the third uh, deployment was on April 25th. A few days later, there's our colleagues from uh, NOVA that, that were still on site and that deployed surf, uh, surface and, and near surface drifters. So this time they all went northeastward. And if we focus on the day of the deployment uh, or the day following the deployment, this is a satellite uh, SAR uh, image from April 26th. And so that's one day after the release of the drifters and we see that the oil is coming, and the, the drifters are more or less following the direction of the oil, which is reversed, which is yeah, different direction from what we, we saw earlier. And later on, those drifters uh, followed the um, various fronts inside the river plume. So we see that the one drifter followed the more um, interior front, mostly north, uh, northeastward, and the, the other group of three drifters had a change in direction that matched quite well what was observed in, in, in um, satellite uh, chlorophyll. So this is uh, to summarize what, what I just presented in terms of drifter trajectories. We see the initial westward deployment, then the sh offshore shoots when the winds reversed. We see the northeastward extension of the third group of drifters, and we see the near surface drifters following that filament that I mentioned uh, offshore. So we really see a few de drifters deployed a few days apart were able to, to go to completely different directions. So that's quite uh, fascinating. So to summarize, so this is the, the all combined trajectories of all the drifters that we deployed on these few days. And we really see, like I said, these three main pathways. So the in green is the initial the pathway that we, we observed, which is the natural downstream uh, direction for the for the, the river plume, the Mississippi River plume. Um, the another group followed the, the 
uh, upstream direction when the wind reverse to westerlies, then the main plume is untrained to the east and favors northeastward um, advection. And we also saw evidence of offshore entrainment under the combined effect of uh, changes in the winds and um, the regional mesoscale dynamics. We were also able to derive some statistics on the behavior of the drifters and compare the surface to the near surface drifters. So for the undrogued surface drifters, we see this is the scatter plot on the top right. And we see that the range in velocities are much larger than the, the near surface drifters, which is on the top left. And we see the main um, favorite sorry, um, direction for uh, advection uh, towards the the west, which is favored by the easterly winds that were dominant as during the our study period as shown in the in the uh, bottom left panel. And the drug drifters, um, the velocities of the near surface drifters are, are less marked and they have the mean component is towards the south and that's associated with the, the uh, this offshore uh, filament that I, I described earlier. And our hypothesis with these drifters is that the very surface drifters are best adapted to follow the, the very surface oil, the, the sheen that is at the, at the very surface of the, of the ocean, whereas the drugged near surface drifters are probably better adapted to follow the, the oil that is in suspension in the top uh, mixed layer. So this, those aspects are still under investigation, but that's another motivation for our work. And uh, the results from this Field work um, is part of a paper that has been submitted recently to JGR and is under review now. I'm going to present now the results from the modeling part. So uh, we used the um, Gulf of Mexico HICOM at uh, 150th degree resolution. Um, it's uh, nested in the operational global ICOM and has improved river physics representation with daily river forcing. That's quite important for our study case, obviously. And it also has data assimilation. And for the results I'm going to present, it's um, assimilation of uh, only surface data, altimetry, and SST. So I'm going yeah, so to present results for the, the period of the field work. So in, on the top left is the model sea surface salinity with the, the arrows are the surface uh, currents. And on the top right is uh, chlorophyll A from satellite. And we see that initially, at the beginning of the experiment, the, the river waters, the extension of the river plume is realistic in, in the dimension. And if we zoom in two days later after, so I superimposed the trajectories of the drifters. So the drifters are observation and the salinity is, is model. And we see that the drifters, the path followed by the drifter quite match, matches quite well the, the form that is uh, represented in the model. So that gives us confidence in the model for those days. Uh, and later on, on May 2, so we see the southward extension compared to the previous case, the plume extended southward and that's something that is represented in the model even if it's a little more pronounced and that's under the effect of the reversal of the winds which I mentioned earlier. We also see an eastward extension towards the coast of Alabama and Mississippi. If I move back and forth we see an extension in the observations and in the model and interestingly also we see a bit of a filament so it's not very clear. I might, I might have adapted the color scale on, on the model but there's a tiny filament of slightly lower salinity extended offshore in the region that, that the drifters followed at that time. And going uh, further in, into May, we see the further extension with these um, uh, westerly winds. And the model also keeps extending, extending offshore. The salinity is more patchy than the, the observed uh, chlorophyll A, but the dimensions are, are realistic. And we still see a filament in uh, lower salinity that is not very marked, but it's still present here and that's uh, that is in the in the same region that the in the same path the same direction that the drifters followed at that time and now going on on uh, <coughs> on mid may we see the further eastward extension along the northern coast so it's not very clear in the observations there is cloud coverage so that's not very helping but if we look at the main front really near the 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 cloud coverage 
and going back and forth, we see an eastward extension, which is present in the model also. And we also see in the observation the presence of a filament extending offshore. It's, we have that in the model. This time it's more pronounced than observed, but it's in the correct region. So that's uh, encouraging. And we also see closer to the Mississippi Delta a retraction of the main plume that has also been observed. It's a little more pronounced. So it's just south of the Mississippi Delta. It's a little more pronounced in the, in the, in the simulation compared to observations, but it's still a, a pattern that is observed. And now going to later, late May, there's a east, uh, eastward extension of the river plume near the coast. That is quite clear if we go between, I don't know. So that's, sorry. This is a eastward extension that we, that, um, we see in the model and it matches also something that is observed in the, uh, in the chlorophyll A. And um, if I zoom in on, on the, this region of this uh, extension along the coast, we see in blue the um, low salinity patch extending quite rapidly along the coast. And the, um, superimposed on that is the drifters, uh, drift trajectory. And we see that the front uh, expands at the, the same velocity followed by the, the drifter. And this is near surface drifter. And now, in addition to circulation model, we use oil spill model. So that's the model named Open Drift, which has been um, uh, developed in Norway with our, uh, by our Norwegian colleagues from the Norwegian Med Office. So it's able to represent different types of processes from biology, search and rescue, and oil spill. I'm going to focus on the oil spill today. So it includes transport processes, taking into account um, outputs from circulation model and also uh, more all specific processes such as dispersion, mixing, emulsion, evaporation. And it's uh, a model that is in constant development and it's uh, really a synergy between the, the, the work in observations and um, that's also, that's part of the, of the project to, to develop the model. Here's an example that it's the, uh, the use of that model in a Norwegian fjord. So it's not the, the same study field, but we, really see how the model uses particles that mimic the oil transport and, and behavior. And we used it, we have initial results for Taylor um, study case. So this is uh, during uh, last April. So the experiment started on April 20. So that's the blue area is the area where oil was observed on that day. So that's the initial condition on that day and on top of those initial conditions there is constant release at the location of the site so it's oil leaking from the bottom reaching the surface and um, and being dispersed and we see in uh, green is the area where oil was observed on april 26 and on red are the dots corresponding to the model simulation with oil uh, presence on april 26 so the red area is really close to the green area and that's um, that's quite satisfying. And we see that two days later, the, the plume changed shape completely, but the simulation doesn't go to that day. Those are observations. And um, so we see the good match between the, that, the, the presence of oil uh, in the model compared to the observed oil uh, from April, for April 26. I have more cases of that oil spill model used going back to the Deepwater Horizon case back in, in 2010. So this is the episode of June. So on the top left is results from the models. So the, the blue and red lines are the front, salinity front from the circulation model. And in black are the, the presence of oil. It's a five or six day simulation. And on the top right is the observed, the presence of oil as observed. So we see a quite nice match in the shape of the, the, the oil slick. And we see that the oil slick followed the front, the salinity front in that area. And was, as we, as I mentioned also in the introduction, the, the oil was blocked by the main front, the blue front here, it doesn't go across it. And that's, that matches what is observed. And you also see the, the how the dynamics of the plume and train oil eastward. And also the, how oil was entrapped to the south in the simulation, it's a, a anti-cyclonic eddy and uh, some oil reaches the, the edge of the of the loop current, and that is also something that has been observed. On the opposite, on July 9, so again on the top left is the 
the oil presence in the oil simulation, and in red is the salinity formed from the model simulation. And we see in the simulation a very more pronounced downstream current, that is the model salinity, and in, that is associated with the westward export of oil in the model that matches quite well what has been observed on the top right. And so to conclude, so about the Taylor site field experiment, we were able to um, collect high resolution observations of the edge of the Mississippi River plume with a very shallow picnic line and a very different vertical structure between the river plume and the, the waters just outside of it. And we also see the abrupt changes in terms of surface currents and also how the front moves really fast. So those are uh, of interest for the, the, the plume dynamics. We, um, we showed also how drifters and, and um, X-band radar are complementary. They provide complementary information that, so the drifters follow the, the front um, for, long, for a long period of time, and um, whereas the radar provides a 2D high resolution in the vicinity of the, of the ship, of the study site. And we saw how the drifters and the oil both followed uh, river waters front uh, at the edge of the river plume and also inside the river plume. And so for that matter, we saw that the location of the river front compared to the source of the oil is really important for the fate of, of the oil. Those, so releasing drifters just a few days apart allowed us to, um, to reveal and yeah, strengthen, uh, reveal the three major pathways of the Mississippi River waters near the Mississippi Delta. So the downstream westward advection, which is the natural path, pathway for the river waters, that is uh, even strengthened with the easterly winds. And we also saw the upstream direction to the northeast, which is favored when the winds reverse to westerly. And we also show the offshore export that is possible when the winds reverse in a, and also that requires the presence of mesoscalades to favor this type of export. And so, yeah, again, this, um, the, the results from the field work are in that uh, publication that is under review. We also saw that the surface and near-surface drifters behave uh, differently, and it's still an open question as to how those two types of drifters relate to the behavior of, of the oil. And this is an open question, and we are still investing it. There has been a, a new uh, field work uh, on the Taylor site in August by Oscar, the, our colleague in the project, and I know also Karth group is working on that topic and probably other groups. Now in terms of um, circulation oil spill modeling, we saw that the Gulf of Mexico uh, HICOM uh, was able to reproduce the river plume in a realistic manner in terms of uh, the scale of the plume and its evolution. We saw, we used the open drift model, which um, is constantly being improved and the type of field work that we have done and that we keep doing at Taylor is important for estimating the parameters of the, of the model, such as evaporation rate and this type of things. I didn't go into details, but it's, there's a lot with this oil model in terms of vertical processes, resuspension, and yeah, it's, it's a very complex um, tool. And used together, we have initial results that are promising for the Taylor site, and we also showed good results for in reproducing the Deepwater Horizon oil spill of 2010, with the, especially how the upstream uh, river plume dynamics prevent oil from reaching the Louisiana coast, and how on the opposite, the downstream advection route favors the westward advection, and this is well represented with, with the, our combined uh, high common and, and oil spill model. And with those tools now, we can do uh, scenario studies, like what if the, the oil spill had happened um, at another time with different conditions, with different loop current, different, different river discharge, uh, or if, it, if the, the platform was located at another area in the Gulf. So this is work in progress, but we have the right tools for doing this type of work. And another, an interesting question in that, um, question is the, what about oil exploration in Cuba? And our, our research group uh, has been recently awarded to study the circulation in that region because it's a region that is poorly known and there's a lot of oil exploration going on now. And we already know that they, there is a very rich dynamics along the coast of Cuba in the southeastern Gulf of Mexico. 
with here this is a again chlorophyll we see presence of filaments and some mesoscale cyclonic eddy and a quite large anti-cyclonic eddy here and you can imagine that all these waters goes offshore and it's in the middle of the strait so that's a real concern and so yeah we are going to study that we already have one paper describing those anti-cyclonic uh, eddies and so it's uh, yeah there's still more to do and to investigate and they will hopefully be the topic of a future seminar. And with this, I thank you all and I will take questions.